was watching a video this morning from Nigeria where a young man who's probably in his late teens, early 20s, um, what I would call a true millennial, was being interviewed regarding being homeless. Now, I, I'm struggling a little bit based on the video and exactly what they mean by homeless because he looked like he was A, well-dressed, uh, B, clean, and C, very articulate. So by homeless, did he mean I don't own a home or I don't have a home or I live on the streets in a box like I know people in the United States do, I know people in other parts of the world. I know people who have, well, nothing. They have no possessions. They live in thatched huts or cardboard boxes and, and their life is pretty abysmal. But this young man seemed to have it all together. Um, but he also had some pretty valid points about how the government in Nigeria is bringing in outsiders and in foreign investments to sell them buildings, to offer them major firms like IT firms and accounting firms and big business opportunities at huge tax cuts. So these people are coming into the country and operating in the same way that they are in their own home country. They're bringing in a lot of money, but the money isn't going into the population base. The money from big mega corporations coming into the country is going into the the tax base or into the government pockets. And so what happens when they do that is they bring in a giant organization. And in his own words, he's talking about a particular firm and he named it, I don't remember the name, but he said this firm is, it's a Chinese based firm. And so the Chinese have brought in all their own employees. They don't speak English and we don't speak Chinese. So they are in our country, they're taking up or they're consuming the uh, expenses that many of us would have, but they're not paying any of us because we don't have the jobs. They're hiring only Chinese speaking people to do the jobs in Lagos, Nigeria. And so the, the challenge with that is pretty obvious. I mean, it doesn't take long to realize that if all of the major industry, if all of the major manufacturing or major uh, quality jobs are going to foreign people, wherever your country is, there's going to be a time when the people who are indigenous to the area don't have quality jobs because the quality jobs have all been taken up. Now, there's a, there's a presumption in that, unfortunately, that kind of follows that pathway that I'm, I'm afraid there are some expectations. So three or four times he says, you only have the opportunity to have the job in security as a cook or as a secretary or a cleaner. He says that three or four times. A cook, a secretary, a cleaner, or security. Those are the only opportunities with these new companies. Now, at the sound of, at the, at the risk of sounding crass or too old fashioned and outdated, I was having a conversation a few years, uh, yesterday with a, few, a man a few years my senior, and his parents were first generation immigrants to the United States. And when they came to the United States, one of the things they had to fill out at Ellis Island was who's going to pay for your basic bills and do you have a job yet? Because their limited ability to stay in the country as an immigrant was directly related to who was going to make sure they got fed. And it was, if that question wasn't answered by the family or by the church, they were many times asked to get back on the boat and go back to wherever they came from. And that seems really harsh. But the idea of dependence on someone else, that reliance nature, uh, that has been ingrained in people over the last couple of decades. The last two generations have really been fed the idea that don't worry about it, someone else will take care of you. Uh, there are people who know for a fact, and, and I, could, I could name a couple of names, I won't, uh, who know for a fact there are people who, for lack of a better term, sponge off the system. People who know that if you walk into the ER of any hospital, they're going to take care of you. They're, they're not going to allow you to be um, left uncared for. And if that means that your child needs a Tylenol because they have a fever, then you will go through the whole process, sit in the waiting room, see a doctor, get a prescription for a Tylenol. And because there are certain hospitals that will take care of you, even if you don't have insurance, you can go through that whole process to get an aspirin or a Tylenol and an hour or two in the waiting room, 10 or 20 minutes with the doctor, a prescription, you go and pick up the prescription in the, in the hospital and you get 
Tylenol. It's basically the same thing you would have gotten if you went to the dollar store and bought it over the counter. The major difference is the burden that that reliance puts on our healthcare system is incredible. I've spoken with physicians who tell stories like when the big, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of it, ARS or S S A R. There was a respiratory infection that went around a couple of years ago that was tragic. Uh, it was impacting some young people so harshly and so quickly, they would come into the waiting room of the ER, not their primary doctor, the ER. They would come into the waiting room of the ER with a mild fever. And because of the influx of people coming in to be treated, their wait time wouldn't be two or three minutes. It would be an hour or two or longer. And these are young people kids four, five, and six years old who would come into the ER with a low-grade fever. And by the time they got to see the physician, they were at a place where their fever was high enough to create permanent brain damage. Some of them would expire while waiting to see a doctor. Now, I don't know about you, but I'd be a little bit irate if I had gone to the doctor for my child's life-threatening illness and found that my child died because someone who was unwilling to go to the dollar store and spend three or four bucks on aspirin would rather sit in the waiting room of the hospital two hours, three hours, four hours, playing on their iPhone, playing with their iPads until the batteries ran out so that they could get a free aspirin from the hospital. To me, there's something twisted in that ideology, but that ideology extrapolated is exactly what causes us to have young people today who say, well, I've already graduated high school, I've, I've already graduated college, I should, and by I should, meaning someone owes me a $50,000, $60,000, $70,000 salary. All the good jobs are going to everybody else. In fact, in the video, and I shared it on my timeline just before this video, in the video, the young man says, look at you, rich man. Look at you, rich man. You own this big building and it's vacant. Why can't we live there? Look at you, rich man. You have a mansion with 22 rooms in it, but you can only sleep in one. How many beds can you sleep in? How many rooms do you need to sleep in? You got 22. You got 22 bedrooms. Why can't I sleep in there? And there's something in that mentality, in that set of expectations that also says. Now, I'm not saying that any of the ideas that he espouses with regard to why people who graduated from high school or graduated from college are not getting good jobs, why the good jobs aren't available. That may all be very well true. And it may also be very true that no one has taken the time to really look at the economic impact other than to say, yeah, if these big companies come in, they write us big checks. But neither does that release the obligation or the expectation that two generations ago would have been placed on the individual coming into the country or born in the country to go get a job. I had my first paying job at 13 years old. At 16, they actually put me on the payroll and I started my job doing the same thing I'd been doing, only now I was doing it with a regular paycheck instead of just tips. By the time I was in college, that same company, that same job had given me three or four pay raises and it was paying my basic bills. The same job I started when I was in high school, in junior high school, that same job was the same job I had as I went to college. Until I went off to join the Air Force, I worked for a grocery store. I started off bagging groceries. I moved to the GM department. I moved to grocery department. I moved to taking care of the floors. And when I moved to a big city, that was all I did was take care of the floors. Those opportunities still exist. How do I know? Because every fast food restaurant in town, in the little town that I live in, it's a town of 30,000 people, every fast food restaurant in town has help wanted signs up. The problem is there are people who feel so entitled. Now, these are people who are perfectly capable of working. These are people who are in the age range that you would think a good second job is a good job. Uh, what would be a second job to an adult who's working 40, 50 hours a week at a regular job needs to pick up a little extra income on the side, waiting tables, that type of thing. Those kind of jobs are great first jobs for someone who's still in school. There are even good career starting opportunities to learn what it is that you like to do or don't like to do, how you work among people. Those are good jobs for people who are just starting out in a career to make sure that you have the discipline to show up at work, to make sure that you are getting a regular paycheck and that you're spending it wisely. 
watch some of the people that go into professional sports right out of high school and right out of college, and you'll see how big paychecks can destroy your life. Learning the process, growing up along the way, is absolutely imperative. Making mistakes when they're small mistakes, absolutely imperative. I heard a, a millennial not too recently say, uh, the problem with the older generation is they don't believe in us millennials enough to let us take a risk. And I'm like, look, I, I got no problem with you taking a risk, but don't take your risk with my stuff. Not with my money, not with my company, not with my brand, not with my reputation, not with my people, not with my customers. The idea of you taking a risk is fine, but take a risk at your own expense. Don't take a risk at someone else's expense. And, and that seems to be a prevalent mentality. You rich man, give us a room in your house. You rich man, give us an office in your big building. You rich man, give us a job because you have the money you should be sharing it with us. In fact, I believe it was the Baltimore incident with the, the rioting in the streets and all the problems and someone put a camera in the young man's face and they said, what's with the rioting? Why are you out here? What, what is it you're protesting? He had nothing to say about the police. He had nothing to say about criminality. He had nothing to say about the looting that was going on or the buildings that were being destroyed or the livelihoods that were being ended. His only comment was, look at all them rich people up there. They ain't trying to give us none. And so there's this resentment that's growing in an entitled people group. And I, for a long time, I thought that was a Western problem. I don't think it's a Western problem. I'm afraid it's a generational problem. It's a global pandemic. We've raised a, a, a generation of people who so expect to get that they are frustrated when they don't get what they want. They're like three-year-olds. Unfortunately, now they're bigger three-year-olds. They're big enough to do damage. They're big enough to cause problems. They're big enough to disrupt society. And as long as they feel entitled, the only way to placate them is to give them what they want. Like a three-year-old who rules the roost when mom and dad have, don't have the will to say no until he screams his lungs out and gives up and realizes it doesn't matter how much I fight against this, this is not gonna change. As long as young people are being raised with the anticipation and the expectation that the world owes them fairness, that the world owes them an income, that the world owes them a job, as long as they are under those false pretenses, their demand level is not gonna go down. And it's gonna create two other problems that I see. People who constantly expect to get, never expect to give. Let me say that again. People who constantly expect to get, never expect to give. Why would they give? That's someone else's job. If I was giving, I wouldn't be getting. That mentality is very, very subtle. And in fact, you won't even hear it espoused. You won't hear it spoken about or celebrated, but, but it's very strong. It's a very strong undercurrent behind the notion that I shouldn't have to wait to get a big job. I shouldn't have to wait to get a new car. I shouldn't have to wait to buy a new house. I finished my school. I'm ready for a big job. I finished my school. <coughs> I'm ready for my big fat paycheck. I finished my school. I'm ready for my big fat house as if just reaching a certain age means poof, it comes. The only thing that I know that comes, and this may only be in America, is that when you reach a certain age, 65 or 70, poof, you get social security. But that may go poof soon in the other way as well. The idea that the world owes you fairness, that the world owes you a living, that the world owes you a place to live is a demonic attack against the welfare of humanity. How do I know that? Because we can go all the way back to the fall in the garden to Adam and Eve. The first commandment God gave Adam and Eve was be fruitful and multiply. After the fall, he said, you will work by the sweat of your brow to produce fruit. You will labor all of your life. The difference was between the, before the fall and after the fall. Fruitfulness was a natural occurrence in the earth. The garden of Eden was lush. It was filled. Life was easy. Connection with God was instant. It took no effort whatsoever. In fact, the word says Adam used to walk with God in the cool of the evening through the garden. God gave Adam assignments like, hey, here's an idea. Why don't you, I don't know, 
find a name for all these critters. That was the kind of work Adam did before the fall. After the fall, God threw them out of the one place that naturally bore fruit with no effort and into a place where everything they did demanded hard work. Nothing in life comes to you without a little bit of hard work. Now, that hard work may be yours alone. It may be yours shared with a person. Maybe yours shared with a team. But nothing produces fruit without some labor. Even the seed thrown into the ground, well watered and fertilized, must fight and struggle and die before it can break through the soil into a plant. And even then, it's got to survive the winter. It's got to survive the spring. It's got to survive the summer. It's got to survive the fall. It's got to survive trampling feet and animals that may eat it, birds that may pluck it out of the ground. It's got to survive all of those things before it becomes a plant big enough, with roots deep enough, with stems strong enough to bear fruit. And unfortunately, we have a generation of young people who have not been taught the proper leadership skills or the proper expectations to understand that if you're not ready to struggle, you're not ready to have. Life doesn't come to you without effort. I've always asked the question, and it's phenomenal, the philosophies of life that you'll hear when you ask this question. I encourage you to adopt it. It might be a good litmus test to understand who the person is that you're having a conversation with. But ask them, are the best things in life free? Or is anything worth having worth working for? Now, you can debate that on an economic level, on a philosophical level, on a theological level, all day long. And really what you're going to get out of that conversation is a deeper understanding of the person you're talking to. Will you get the best things in life by doing nothing? Or is anything that you want worth struggling to get? If the butterfly didn't struggle to get out of the cocoon, it would die a worm with wings. If the seed didn't struggle to get out of the ground, it would die and turn back to dirt. If we don't teach the power of the process and the need for the struggle to become resilient, to become powerful, to become life-changing, to become world-changing, then we're going to have a generation that never reaches the place of maturity to give to others in need because they will always be the one who needs someone to fulfill their wants, not their basic needs, but their wants. If you watch the level of demand and expectation of many millennials, we're creating a giant vacuum. As the older generation, what many would call the greatest generation, the warriors of World War II, as they pass on into their sunset of life, whether they're living on Social Security or a fixed income, some of them are expiring and moving on to the next life, as that continues to happen, those who are filling the gap from the 25s to the 45s, many of them are raising their children with the same level of expectation that they were raised. That the world owes me, I better get a good job. If not, I'm going to protest in the streets. If I don't like the job, if I have to work too hard, if I have to show up every day, then I'm going to protest. I'm going to throw a fit. Do you know why every fast food restaurant in town has a help wanted sign up? I can give you an example. I have a son who's 18 years old. Um, I saw a need for employees at a, a particular place that I was dining not too long ago. And when the manager came to my table because we were getting horrible service, I asked him, I said, are you guys short staffed? He said, we are perpetually short staffed. Short -staffed. I said, what do you mean? He said, it doesn't matter how many people I hire. They don't want to show up for work or when they're here, they don't want to work. They want to stand around on the phone. I can't get them to do the work diligently. I can't get people who will show up and do the work. It's like they expect to come here and get a paycheck, but they don't want to have to work to get the paycheck, right? So these are people who actually accomplish the process of getting a job, but they don't want to do the work of getting the job. They don't want to struggle in the job to keep the job or to get a raise. They just expect to show up and get a paycheck and only to show up when they feel like it. And then half the time they show up and they're not doing their job while they're there. And I said, well, I have an 18-year-old son who just got his third promotion in his job, um, but they're really not treating him right. I'm, I'm watching their leadership skills. I'm watching the way they're treating my son, and I'm ready for him to move on. Uh, he has invested a lot of time in them. He has poured himself into that job. He has learned everything they put in front of him. The raises have been slow. The teamwork has been horrible. 
the negotiation skills among the team are horrible. And I, I just don't, I don't see any good benefit for him in saying, even with the next level of promotion, there's not an opportunity to do a whole lot different. He's kind of capped out at 18. How sad is that? And I, I said, are you looking to hire? And he said, I am. Uh, like I said, we're always hiring. And I said, well, if you'll bring me an application, I'll make sure that he fills it out and comes back for an interview. Well, just the conversation between me and the, and the manager created a little bit of curiosity, I guess, for their sake. So my son filled out the application, told him where he went to school, told him how he's been trained, told him the places he's worked before, the accomplishments he's had in his job, and went in for his interview. And in the interview, one of the managers said, well, what do you think of, of working in a place like this? He said, you know, I'm sad to say that one of my biggest observations is that most people my age want to walk around with their phone in their hand. They're not paying attention to the customers. They're not paying attention to anybody else's needs. They're not taking care of the, the little details that need to be taken care of. They're just caught up in their own world. And the manager about fell out of his chair. He's like, I, it's very true and everybody talks about it, but I've never heard a teenager willing to admit that's the biggest problem with our generation. And I told him when he went in, I said, listen, they may be hiring in all positions. They may want you to start as a host or a hostess, as a busboy, as a dishwasher or something in the kitchen and work your way up to becoming a server because there's a lot more money to be made as servers. But I'm going to tell you right now, you have already worked hard enough, proven yourself in the last two jobs that you've had, starting at just after his 17th birthday. The last two jobs that you've had, you've invested yourself, you've proven yourself, you've earned your way up. You have not lost the ground that you've gained. And your paycheck doesn't reflect being a starter. Do not go in there with an assumption of that they owe you. But you at the same time should negotiate very clearly and say to them, what type of position would you have open for me? And if they don't offer you a, starter, a job starting as a server, then simply say to them, my next paycheck is X. And if you can't match that, I'll stay put. The accomplishment has already been proven. The struggle has already been done. The earning of the way into management, into the next level, has already been accomplished. The personality, the character, and the integrity are all well established and well documented by multiple people. <laughs> when that's the case, expecting the next level job, perfectly expectable. Obedience brings provision. When you are a type of person who shows up at the job on time, every time, no late, no show, no call, you're out. If you're on time every time, if you're doing the work at hand while you're there, if the results that you're demonstrating are good, you will never be looking for a good job. Good jobs will be looking for you. If you are entitled and expecting to show up and not do the work, not only will you be looking for another job, but you'll be looking for a job that's not looking for you because the type of people who don't work hard are not looked for in any job. Those are called dependents. We as parents, we all have them to a certain point. There is a certain place in life when a dependent should become independent and should pack their bags and go get their own home, should take care of their own responsibilities and their own bills and generate their own income to the level necessary to do that. But they also have to understand that their ability to generate income and the things that they want, that quality of life should match each other. Just because your parents started you off good in life doesn't mean they're gonna support you at that level all of your life. At some point, you gotta grow up. We don't need a generation of 40 year olds with 14 year old mentalities. We don't need a generation of people who should be giving and providing and taking care of not only their own kids, but helping out the world. One of the greatest giving generations of all time was one of the brokest generations of all time. Those who came through World War II, those who survived rations, those who had nothing, those who watched entire industries wiped out by war, Millions of people devastated by war, hundreds of thousands of their own friends killed by war. As the world was rebuilding, they gave more by percentage than anyone else in history. And as that generation moves into Social Security and their capacity to give diminishes, or as they die off and leave their inheritances to entitled people, 
the world that has operated providing food, providing clothes, providing shelter, providing medicine all over the globe, initiated by the giving hearts of these people, is going to change. We've created a vacuum. We've created a need for people to grow up. And I don't mean just be older adolescents. I mean grow up. Grow up in maturity. Grow up in strength. Grow up in wisdom. And learn not to take, but to give. I'm J. Lauren Norris, and you've been watching Tell It Like It Is TV. Have a blessed day.